I shot my friends with BB guns. You know, this was a this was a necessary part of my life and my formation. And I told the kids, I'm gonna I'm gonna describe the shooting of my friends with BB guns, not prescribe it. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not giving permission necessarily. All right, welcome back. My name is Jason Craig. This is the Till and Keep uh, podcast where we discuss. Uh, like all podcasts claim to do, the intersection of stuff and things, particularly um, how uh, many of us are trying to recover the idea of, of having, you know, a home that's actually a household that's uh, functioning as a place of of meaning uh, and purpose. And for a lot of us, that means a place of education. I know a lot of, uh, for myself, I we, we homeschool our kids sorts of challenges because I did not grow up homeschooling. I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't grow up Catholic. I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't grow up farming. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, But I did grow up as a kid uh, in the 90s. And I have, uh, you know, there's there's a danger of too much uh, introspection and uh, and navel gazing, uh, perhaps when you're in the 90s. And now uh, you're realizing that that was some kind of unique era, which I didn't begin realizing until I heard that the show Friends was like s- still some sort of massive sensation amongst people. Uh, the explanation being that it depicted um, a group of friends uh, in a sitcom that didn't have cell phones and lived in some sort of approximate location to one another uh, and you know maintained friendships without media, but still it looked kind of modern and hip and cool. And Jennifer Aniston was beautiful, and that helps the show. Um, the 90s seemed to be some sort of strange bridge uh, to a whole new world that we now live in. Uh, and that has to do with the guests I have today, uh, Jordan Almanzar. Am I saying that right, Jordan? Yep, that's exactly right. Oh, man, nailed it. All right, we didn't even, we didn't even practice that. Um, I, as I've been thinking about growing up in the nineties, uh, it, it comes to the fore a lot when people call me a millennial. Now I think there is some sort of technicality that I am because I was born in 1984. However, uh, throughout through up through high school, I did not have, uh, social media and cell phones. Um, whereas now when someone thinks millennial, they think saturated in technology, which now there wasn't time we were sat, but we weren't saturated. I mean, I remember in school going to the library and they're saying, Hey, we have this thing called the internet. And we all gathered around this giant screen, um, which was somehow supposed to be better than Oregon trail, which it wasn't while we watched for like 30 minutes while a pixelated giraffe slowly revealed itself on the screen. And. I thought I'm going to go get a book and look at a draft. This is this thing's never going to take off. Um, that th- my experience of high school, my experience of adolescence, without the ubiquitous, just complete takeover of of media, was something different. And also, uh, our guest is going to help us to consider why was there uh, there was like the '60s recognizable, the '70s recognizable in dress and music, the '80s recognizable in dress and music, even the nineties recognizable in dress and music. And now there's just this constant uh, thing that's like sort of metastasized into this giant mass culture, uh, that mass media and pop and all that stuff. So we're going to get into that, but most importantly, um, my guest today, he wrote a book, uh, called when the earth was flat, one boy's life at the edge of the millennium. Uh, if you're a subscriber to Sword and Spade, uh, you, you, we actually sent this book out to subscribers. That's how uh, to to all of them or to the the, the guild subscribers, uh, because I read this and I and I felt like someone has written for the the '90s kid who has seen something pass away from the earth. Um, I think what this book is, is uh, sort of our little house books. So if any of you read the little house books to your kids, like little house on the prairie, whatever little, you know, cabin in the woods or, uh, or farmer boy, uh, we read all of them. Farmer boy is our favorite because we have more boys and that's the only one that's kind of masculine has a boy in it. Um, it tells of an era that you really can't understand our country. I think without kind of grasping what the little house books like their life 
uh, what and and that's why we read it with a certain with a with a good form of nostalgia that we would not be who we are without the people that are representing this book. At the same time, and looking at it romantically and uh, uh, all of that, but at the same time recognizing this has passed. Something has passed on from that way of life. Jordan, I think you have written the book for the '90s kid that recognizes you have to read this uh, to under, or at least this is how I felt in my house uh, reading this book was. I'm going to pass this on to my family so that they sort of understand something that I grew up in um, that has now passed away. And we didn't grow up the same. I mean, I, I very different neighborhoods. And but I shot my friends with BB guns. You know, this was a this was a necessary part of my life and my formation. And I told the kids, I'm going to I'm going to describe the shooting of my friends with BB guns, not prescribe it. OK, so I'm not, I'm not giving permission necessarily. Um, but I do I do want to talk about it. But this your book talks about the, really us growing up, and we're it, we're, we're in the um, the new era, the new um, I don't know what order of things. But this is I mean it's essentially pre internet, and not just the internet as a as a tool, but what it, what it has done um, to the world of entertainment culture, all that stuff. So with that being said, before I start asking you um about the book uh dr amanzar i don't know anything about you now i've only read this book but i read on the on the back of it uh, a distinguished instructor of classical languages longtime faculty member of colby academy uh etc cetera, etc cetera. um um i have no idea how you went uh, sort of how this book ends and then and then where you are now so so where are you now you've you've got a family do you have children shooting each other with bb guns are you homeschooling tell me about that yeah i so i have five five children four girls and a boy um which is kind of the opposite of uh how i grew up it was all all brothers and cousins a very very male dominated in in my growing up years and so i, I did not expect to have all these girls but um yeah they're all at home still the oldest is 14 we're homeschooling them the youngest is four, so she hasn't really started. Um, but, uh, you know, I I, I kind of dropped out of culture, pop culture, in 2008. So I've, you know, you're talking about the, the takeover of the Internet. I love how you set that up because I, I, uh, I, I never, I, I've never had a, a smartphone and now it's like a purposeful thing. I don't want to have to work all the time. I, I would never get left alone by, by my job at Colby Academy if I, if I uh, had a phone on me all the time. So I don't, uh, I don't own a, a cell phone. And I, I think that was a big part of uh, when I moved to Germany, I didn't need it. So I just, I moved to Germany in 2008. And we stayed there for for 10 years so a whole decade gone and when i came back to the us i i just felt this big uh change in everything i mean i was still i, I remember i went I, I before before 2018 a little bit earlier i was visiting for a summer back in the us and uh i went into a blockbuster video <laughs> This is I, I didn't even stream movies or anything. I went into this blockbuster video and they were closing. Everything was like empty. And I just felt so out of it. Like, what has happened here? And and self checkouts at the grocery store. I, I didn't know how to use. It. I'm like, this is amazing. Like people do. They, they trust them. They're not just stealing things. How do they well, know? You, and you were gone then. So if I if I'm remembering correctly, so I, you know, I don't know if people are listening. If they can, I don't think they can see our videos. But here's here's my my uh, flip phone. There you go. To, uh, yeah, it's not a page. <laughs> I look like a page. I can't believe you even bring up pagers in your first couple of pages of this book. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um, but I think so. If I remember correctly, you were basically gone for the decade when the iPhone took over, right? Because didn't it come out two thousand seven or eight or somewhere around there? Yeah, I think it did. I think the iPhone one came out around there. So I never, I never converted. So I did have, you a, were gone. I had a little flip phone before I left, um, before I went to, to Germany, but, uh, I never, I never got anything else, uh, since then. I think that's made a big, a big difference. So the, you know, my wife has a, a phone and, and it's a little bit selfish. A lot of people say like, they, they're like, Oh, I envy you for, for not having a phone now. But it's because I can rely on anybody around me. I'm like, oh, can you take a picture yeah. of that and email it to me? And whatever. <laughs> so it can become a little yeah, bit selfish. I, do I don't need GPS. I don't need GPS. <laughs> Everyone else has it, right? I'm amazing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do talk in the book about wanting to come home to, uh, to, to homeschool the kids. That was really the thing. I mean, I loved Germany. I, we, we, we were content on, on staying there and, and just living there forever. But it was the schooling part of it that sort of drove us away where it was like our kids are, are, you know, by force of law going to school in Germany. And I wanted them to homeschool and get some of the experiences that I had had. And my wife is from a completely different background. She's a city girl, went to public school, all of that. So it was, it's been an adjustment for her, but, uh, but, but we see it as the best. I mean, we're homeschooling our five kids and it's a a busy time, but, uh, but that's what we're up to. All right. So that's what I want to, I don't know if I set it up correctly. The reason I, I, uh, for those of us, I think people may, that probably listen to this podcast, there's probably a lot of homeschoolers out there or maybe those that are sympathetic towards it. And um, your book ha- is also this transition to homeschooling, because, I mean, in the, you know, the 80s and 90s, there wasn't a lot of homeschooling, uh, especially now and especially, you know, post COVID. I mean, there's just it's exploding um, for yeah. better or worse, because it's exploding in the Internet age. And uh, I have I actually. um so in, in other posts I work with is called Fraternus. You know, it's 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 all about mentoring young men and helping men, be, you know, young men become mature, helping boys become men, right? And um, I actually increasingly um, am skeptical of the homeschool world, not because I don't believe we're we're homeschooling, we're we're doing it, but in a lot of instances, what it's doing to um, to boys can actually be problematic because it is so dominated um, by mothers, which. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying anything wrong with that, except when there is, which is when they're kind of stuck at home on an island with mom, like Telemachus, waiting for Odysseus to get home so he can have an adventure. You know, a lot of them are sitting inside, sort of surrounded by the bullies of the world, you know, eating up the storehouse and they're, you know, whatever. Because mm-hmm. um, you're, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm a home. I wrote this book about how I was homeschooled, but your mother is this. Uh, I don't know if it's, I wouldn't call it reckless, but this idea, you, you homeschooled them, homeschooling you then was an adventure, an a uncharted pioneering of something new, at least in that era. I mean, it would have been unheard of. Uh, and I, I don't want to just rehash stories from the book, but the hilarious, when you are realizing you're not going to have to get on the school bus and you're, <laughs> and you want them to, and you want them to see, you want the other students to see. And how even the school bus driver is incredulous and ha- you're like yelling, tripping over yourself in the bushes. I'm not going. And uh, it's hilarious. I read that out loud to my to my wife. Um, I I grew up a um, little bit of a pri- little bit of Catholic school when I but but I was not a Catholic then. And th- that's kind of another story, but uh, mostly public school. Um, but. A, I, I would say basically an only child with a fairly significant benign neglect from my parents. My parents were divorced. You know, maybe there was they were distracted with other things, or maybe they just gave me a lot of whatever it was. When I got home, I don't. My wife says I don't even know how you made it through school because I, I never did anything like homework uh, right. until my my intellectual life did not wake up. Now I have a master's, but it didn't wake up until I became a Catholic. So, you know, in, in you know twenty twenty one. But before that, it was very much, I mean, the, the, the woods, the BB guns, the, the forts, um, the adventures was my, my entire life. So that, I was really relating. Um, and I keep bringing up the BB gun. I think I'm even going to title this because I just, I had not <laughs> read someone. It, it sounds like just, I think to, um, to somebody, it might just sound like reckless stupidity of just shooting each other BB guns. But there, actually there was, when you described the the order that must be formed and the the trust and the mistrust and the violation of how many pumps are acceptable and all yeah. that, there, there, there was some real formation for me going in to that. Anyway, my what I want to ask you about though, um, is are you, you, your experience of homeschooling, because now you're an educator, right? Yeah. I mean, you're in education. Mm-hmm. Your experience of homeschooling doesn't sound like what I hear a lot of homeschoolers are, are doing what is um, so now, now that you're in education, you're in homeschooling, you're working with Colby Academy, um, you're at Magdalene. May she rest in peace. Um, you're you're so you're experiencing probably a lot of homeschoolers coming through. And I think of educators like John Senior, who uh, was very skeptical of homeschoolers, even though probably the homeschool world is the biggest reader of John Senior now. Um what would be some of the the biggest like problems 
that you're seeing uh, in homeschooling that's very different from your experience of, you know, Indians and, and justice and BB guns? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because, the, you know, I think it's over schooling. Too much schooling is something that we don't we don't talk about it. And, and it, you know, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, it hurts our institutions. If, if so, if somebody goes to Colby Academy, there is, uh, you know, we want them to take as many courses as much as we can. We keep them very busy and all of that. And I've always since my time there and a lot of people there would disagree with me, you know, is I'm I'm pushing for like private time for the chance to go on these adventures as as students. And, you know, there is something that we have at Colby. We call it the embrace the fifth day. And that means like Fridays should be pretty, pretty free for students to just go do whatever they want go on, go on, go to a museum or something with their families. But my girls who are doing Colby online you know, they're, they're spending a lot of Friday doing homework. So I think I, I was basically unschooled. I, I mean, my mom, as you mentioned, she was, she was I, my portrayal of her. Um, I'm surprised she likes it. Actually. I, I had to run the chapters by different people in the family to make sure, because there, there are times in there where she just looks like a really young, irresponsible mother, just letting us out there, throwing knives, shooting BB guns and, you know, being gone all day. And uh, that freedom was very important to my own formation. And, and there's a time, you know, it's like diagramming sentences. I, I hate diagramming sentences. I hate students doing it. I think it's it's a it's just another form. And people will disagree. They'll show how valuable something like that is. But I'm like, I didn't I didn't do anything like that until much later. I didn't even learn the languages that I teach professionally now, Greek and Latin, until I was in graduate school. So there, mm-hmm. sure, I, I, I would have liked to learn them younger, maybe. But on the other hand, I don't know if I would trade that for the freedom that I got, the freedom that I was allowed. To yeah. just, this, this idea of self-education, discovering your own limits, discovering the dangers without being told, you know, that's too far. Yeah, we, that, we worked, it out, we I, worked uh, it out ourselves. The desire for this hyper control, it grates on me. I, uh, I'm a recovering libertarian you know, by nature, um, meaning, you know, so that's a whole nother podcast, but you know, we, we need one another and it's not, you know, don't tread on us is acceptable, but I'm also, um, recognizing that my, fr- I was unschooled because I sort of rejected school and nobody was mm-hmm. paying attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and so I was, I had a case, there was, there's a case to be made that I was headed towards disaster. And there, there, there was times in my life, uh, except for the God's grace and good mentors, I, w- I would have been headed or I was, I'm sorry, I was in disaster, knee deep, waist deep, chest deep. And, um, but the adventure, uh, part of it was necessary. And I too, so now I am, I mean, when people ask me like, what do you do? Um, I'm primarily a writer and an editor. I have, I am so unqualified for this is I've fallen into it. I don't know how my, I come in and they're actually diagramming sentences. Like, I have no idea. I, I edit a magazine. I have no idea how to do it. And uh, I've actually, I have a friend. He's not too far from here. Joseph Pierce. Um, oh, he's on the back of your book. Yeah. And he, you know, my wife was asking him about that. Like, do you teach grammar directly? And he said something to the effect of, you know, some people just get it and they don't, they get it from experience. And um, yeah. my education, if you could call it that, was so much like yours of just almost reckless benign. And I think because, I don't know if you, if, if listeners have noticed, but we're both males, uh, that to be a boy and to have the freedom necessary uh, to to uh, experience and pursue um, these interests, and and I think you can safely call, especially your book, obsessions, um, and to have the adventures and the dangers. Uh, I think in one of John Senior's books, he says, "Yeah, you know these these homeschooling families send their students to me uh, uh, as panty waist, I believe he calls them wrapped up in the pretty little age of 12, never growing up and having, you know, being able to get into adventures and danger and love. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the experience of just go, I mean, I remember I, I, going out, we, we would go camping and have no idea what the forecast would be and be just completely woefully unequipped. And we're, you know, we're probably two miles into the woods or something. And then it just starts pouring rain and we have no tent. We were, <laughs> we're like making, I just, but I can't imagine not having those things. So I have five boys. 
I have uh, eight children. Five of them are boys. And there was five in a row. So we had a decade of savagery and boys. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I grew up as an only child, not a Catholic. So I, I'm not reporting to know what I'm doing. Um, but we certainly um, have on our farm people come over and and they're shaken because they're they're like grabbing my attention. And, hey, that five year old over there has a machete. And, I, and I'm like, or no, one of them said one of the oh, one of them came up to my son and says, what are you doing with that giant knife or sword? And and he looked at her like she was insane. Said, it's a machete. He's very <laughs> upset by this. And my, and my son has a Ford and, and, and all this stuff. So I think it has something to do with you. You were a boy and you needed that. And when you talk about overeducation, tell me more about how you understand this balance, because I think it's a it's only, it's not a tension between my, my wife and I. It's, it's in, a, in a good way. You know, she's sort of bringing them in and, and culturing and nurturing and teaching them. And I'm dragging them out and handing them weapons and sending them into the woods between um, self-education. Because I think that's what I was going to mention. You, I'm glad you brought it up. It's on page five. I think I've the thin line running through our own history is an increasing confidence in the value of self-education and education that must be based on one's unique strengths and interests. Time and then down to the time is needed for self-education, generous and without distractions. So you, you've got a bunch of girls. So tell me, is that, uh, yeah, tell me more of your philosophy and thought on, are, should we be treating boys and girls different, especially when it comes to giving them this free time to in their, in their interests and obsessions? Well, it's, it's with, I've noticed with my own kids, how they spend it is different. Of course, like between, between my son and the way that my daughter see, like my son is, he just turned eight. He's obsessed with uh, making all these weapons that he's wanting to fight a bear. We live up in New Hampshire and he wants to make these weapons to go fight a bear, you know? And so I just let him and he makes a huge mess in the garage with all these nails and stuff. But and my wife's a little bit, she didn't have any, any brothers or anything. So she's kind of like, is that okay that he's doing that? So I'm always advocating for it. Like, let him, yeah, he's fine. He's fine. She's, she's more like we, the, things need to be a little more structured. She doesn't like the chaos, but I'll tell you with my girls, um, they, they are, they're really, into, they're excellent musicians. We, we, they, we got them piano lessons and stuff and they will spend the older two girls will spend, I mean, five, seven hours a day, sometimes writing music, writing my, my 11 year old wrote a, wrote an entire musical. That's legit good. Like we're going to try to try to get someone to, 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 to do it. It's called Salem. And it's about the witch trials, but she wrote all the music, all the spoken parts, all of that. And I and she did that over the summer. And I'm like, look, if we if we said we we want her to learn how to do this, and we need to take these courses, we need to send her to to like learn how to write music and learn how to how to actually structure a musical, it, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, what she did though was yeah. she imitated creatively. Another so the other person that endorsed the book, Anthony Esselin, who lives here in in New Hampshire, he's, he's right over the hill from me. He he was teaching writing classes here at Magdalen, and and his thought what um, apparently what I so I'm not quoting him because I didn't hear him say it, but students told me that he said find writers that you like and, and imitate them. So I think there's so much in self education and in education in general that that belongs to the realm of imitation. And in my book, I talk a lot about learning all the things that were most important to me, which were little things like hunting, skinning rabbits, fishing from my old man neighbor. So I really looked up to this guy. And so in that sense, it's the same with boys and girls in that the girls are imitating things that they really like, which happen to be music and, and performance and things like that. Whereas my son is looking on how to how to make weapons, how to how to he's kind of like me. He wants to be like an Indian out out in the woods or something like that. And so in those ways, it's different, but they'll both soak up the uh, boys and girls will soak up the private time. And I, I think it's very important. So I'm the advocate for that. And my wife is the advocate for structure. And so there's some kind of balance. My growing up was not yeah. bal balanced at all, but there's is a little more balanced and maybe that's better. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to see. I like how you say that so soberly. We had no balance completely. Yeah, the stories of your mom, like she's like trying to teach you something and throws her hands in the air. Just get out of the house. That's exactly I'm trying to tell my wife, like, just do that on those days where it's going. Just send them out here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, one yeah, thing I think people... one thing you're bringing up, and we 
Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, I was just going to say to the listeners, not to worry too much. I mean, think about think about like the setting. You you were right when you say like this was very pioneering for my parents to do this. It was very radical at that time. Now I feel like the homeschooling movement is becoming a little a little safe. Like you don't have to worry about anything. We've got the institutions which will take care. We've got the curriculum for you. We'll, we'll take care of everything. But there was something in that radicalness that that made it vibrant. I think. But to anyone out there, no matter how you're doing it, you're you're going to be fine. It's going to work out okay. Read the book and you'll see that my mom was not qualified. Everything turned out pretty much okay, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, that word safe, um, that really, I don't know, that's something's become safe in a way that's, that's bad. Yeah. Um, and one thing though, I think, it, I think it's fair to say, I, maybe we should give you, you and I, this almost seems luxurious because the the setting that we were not in was the modern suburbia. Yeah. I think that and and it provides a different encounter. And and my reflection on that has been, you know, my the first neighborhood I lived in um, was actually between my my father and my uncle had renovated this old like I guess they're called townhomes. I don't know what it, it looks like a castle they're made of stone. Um, big, ca and it was between two section eight housing units. And if you don't know what section eight housing, it's the projects, it's government funded, low income, predominantly black, um, housing. And those were all my friends. I was the only white kid on the block hmm. across the street from this was acres and acres of woods. Um, so I'm like the only white kid, you know, I got beat up plenty, um, acres and acres of woods. The next neighborhood I lived in was a trailer park. And full of like the most interesting characters. I mean, you you have your neighbor that you learned a lot from, and then you felt bad when you when you shot him. Mean, the other day, I was like, my kids love to hear these like ridiculous stories I have of setting off an M.A. man's front porch and watching him come out. But he had like tongue cancer, so when he yelled, his tongue was just swollen and he couldn't speak to us. But he would drive, I guess, because he was a, a a drunkard and uh, lost his license. He would drive this lawnmower with a trailer up back. And he had a trailer on the back, of, yeah, on the back of the lawnmower, and he'd go to the store. We'd hop in the back and just ride, see where he's going. And he loved it, you know. These kids, and that sounds like if if you try to describe that, if you were speaking at a homeschool conference, well, what you need to do is find a drunkard in a trailer that drives to the liquor store, with, and I'm riding in the back of this, like. But I can't, I can't, I can't imagine life without these adventures. Yeah. Uh, and then now we live, um, and, and and for a little while later, probably like 15 through 18, I lived in a suburb, predominantly white of a middle-class suburb, and I can never do it again. Um, hmm. So the reason I'm bringing that up, the whole, the, the safety thing, cause now, now we live on, um, we live on a farm in Western North Carolina. This is where I'm from, North Carolina. And um, one thing about your book that, that I don't know if you've thought about or if you've spoken about this, that's different is that you, you are in a place that allows for adventure and danger in a way that's beautiful. And I think uh, that's what I'm, I'm very grateful now that we're able to be in a place where we have this, our neighbors, we have, I mean, my kids have the, you know, the drunkard neighbor that, and he's a golden, but they see he's a golden heart. His, his place is a total disaster, but he remembers all of my children's name, all eight of them in their middle names in their wow. birthdays. And he's just this giant glowing heart. And, but if anyone looked at his, if they drove by his place, it'd be oozing with judgment. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. But t tell me about your experience, though. Your your place was so different. So have yeah. you tried to recreate it or are you just in some like vanilla boring suburb or like how have you have you reconciled that? Yeah, it, it, it's very different. So I as I described in the book, I was out way out on the eastern prairie in a in a drive past town. I mean, it was a my my brother tells me don't ever go back because it'll it'll ruin it uh, for you because it, it really is. I I tried to make my place look look beautiful, um, and I still have this attachment to it. I I talk to people that are there that have read my book and they, they appreciate most of what I most of what I said. I think kind of putting it on the map a little bit because it's just this tiny little place out in the prairie, but. Where I am now is is a little New Hampshire village called Warner, which is where uh, where um, Magdalene. Yeah, that's why we moved here. Is Magdalene's right up there? I'm at, I'm I'm up at Magdalene right now, and the offices, and my house is just down the road. 
uh, it's it's a, it's not the same. We we were able to get so we have a place in town, and we just have like an acre and a half in the back, which was important because I wanted to at least be able to have some small animals and stuff. So we have chickens, um, and we had goats, and I, I'd like to get some sheep and and stuff. So here where we are, we can at least have that on our our land behind us. But I mean, it's a it's a tiny little kind of an idyllic village. People that uh. People that, and it sounds funny to say village, probably to most of the, the the rest of the country, but in New England, you still can, can use that. But uh, my uh, my, you know, we have it to some extent, I guess. It's it's not it's not what I had though, with just the the vast openness where you could just keep going and going and going. But because it's wooded, there's enough. It's it's a different thing. In a prairie, you need tons and tons of space, but in the woods, you can find a lot of adventures just right around the corner. Yeah. So it's it's more like that, I would say. Is that something you've seen though? I mean, when you're working in education, does it is it? Um, Why well, you know? I don't feed the witness here, but it, my observation is it seems like a deficit, a sense of place where you can actually go out and have adventures. Um, yeah, where there's a little bit of expanse. And and that plays into you know the the um, maybe too much schooling or whatever and and I guess I I don't want to I don't want to put that down too much because there are kids that that become I mean they're just super individuals as they grow up I've I've been teaching at Colby long enough ten years now where I see them become adults and have children and all that but when they were students they they lived in the suburbs and and they did everything in books and online classes and stuff and. I, I don't think they really saw, I think they live vicariously through my stories, uh, wishing that they had that kind of a, an up, upbringing, but they've turned out just fine and they've become excellent individuals. But man, I would encourage people, give your kids that that chance to 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 just be themselves out in God's green earth and yeah. and, and away from technology. I mean, that, that meant the yeah, world. Yeah, I don't want to feed a... I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to feed parents another thing to worry about. Oh no, we're, you know, we're too suburban now. We got to get out and have some you know, adequate danger time. Uh, I don't want to do that, but I think it's part of, you know, in, in your book, when you, that you're on the cusp of the the sort of takeover of the internet um, and then the adventures of homeschooling and all that, there, there is something. Um, and, and maybe the, I mean, maybe the thing we're discussing really is just the sort of controlled environment yeah. of, of, particularly boys and young men, but, but of, of students and not being able to develop, um, themselves. And that, so inching towards that, my, you brought up my, uh, your kids liking weapons. We have a picture of my son when he was seven or eight and he's, he's got a bow that he made and he's looking at, at the picture, he's looking at the camera, right? You know, like kind of side eye, <laughs> looking at it. And our joke is now that we look at it, cause now he's 13 the joke is the caption for the picture is you think this is a phase because he has <laughs> endlessly obsessed about making weapons. Um, I'm always like, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, Henry. And he said, Oh, this is my peacemaker. You know? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he makes swords. He's got a forge. Uh, mm. He's just, you know, ballistas, like all these, I don't even know the, I don't even know the lingo. I never had the obsession with um, weapons outside of some, you know, BB gun, the normal ones, guns and knives. He's got, uh, you know, yeah, Belts, yeah, but and, all these th other things. and think about how much if 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 he just keeps going deeper with that obsession, how much he'll learn. I mean, so often, and especially in liberal arts circles, um, it, it's like you need this. They they claim this well-rounded education, which which is great, and I and that's what I'm trying to provide for my my older daughters. But for me, it was all it was obsessions that where I went deep all the way when I did my PhD, it was the same thing. It's just going extremely deep in a narrow way. But and that's kind of looked down on, I feel like, in, a, in American liberal arts circles somewhat. But I would advocate for it, at least in my own experience, that when you go deep in one area and just keep going like your son, Henry, if he keeps learning more and more, he'll want to know the history of it. He'll learn about like iron and bronze and all these ages and things if he just keeps going and that's an education that 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 i think is invaluable so i i love the idea of letting letting people really focus on what they love and just run with it as much as possible yeah my uh, i know the liberal arts circles and the, you know the homeschool world there's like the charlotte mason circles and and uh which i know my wife a lot of so we have a lot of literary you know it's a very bookish home uh household or have a lot of stories a lot of ideas 
And I think that's where we've, you know, and that's the whole well-rounded thing. You want to give them all these ideas and, 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 but I think we've had to learn as they get older, these obsessions are great. I mean, my daughter, my 14 year old daughter is currently obsessed with, with cheeses. You know, we have a small dairy, so we, we milk uh, six Jersey cows. We have great, you know, she's got the resource there. Um, and she's like, you know, obs- just obsessing about cheeses. And this is great. Um, what's the difference? But as you're saying that, I know that in, in the liberal arts and the you know classical world, there's, um, I think, an, a good reaction against um you know the the hyper focus on expertise you know in the modern ed, you know uh, educational world and even uh the world of work uh that we're you know experts in this you know we become these obsessive experts and we were not well-rounded as adults but it doesn't seem to be that's what's happening when a child is carried to it that's not what happened to you when you became obsessed with being an indian um mm-hmm. when you were young uh, mm-hmm. which by the way if you you Please buy this book because it's hilarious. His uh, Jordan's uh, you 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 think you were into being an Indian when you were a little boy, but you, you need to read this book to understand uh, how obsessed when you're when I when I picture you walking in wearing your gear to a high school class when you were like in middle school or something and and uh, instructing them on the ways of it it's knowingly. So anyway, what's the uh, what what's the difference between allowing these obsessions to take place? Is that something different from uh, what sort of what we're trying to do with students later and making them, you know, uh, hyper focused experts? Yeah, it, it could be. I mean, the something that that in in these you know, so I, I'm working the whole gambit from Colby Academy, which which starts at kindergarten and goes up through high school and then also college students here at Magdalen. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing like, you know, I think, I think that the whole movement sometimes gets stuck in, in a certain stage, which is ask the perennial questions. Like, what does it mean to be a human? Let's read the great books that have, that have animated people throughout history and all of that. But my, my, my expertise that I, you know, I did in Germany was, was in early Christianity. So a New Testament and and into the you know third century or so fourth century of of Christian history, and what we've always seen, and I think it's missing today is is a final stage of Christian paideia, which is uh, t- towards the Bible. So I think there's a there's a there's a missing element there in Catholic education circles. In fact, I was at a ICLE conference, uh, the national conference, and a question was posed to one of the speakers, what, how does the Bible fit into our liberal arts curriculum? And he basically said, we don't know, we, 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 we don't know what to do with the Bible. And I think it's because in our day, we read it as a means to an end, like here at Magdalen, they'll do New Testament in one semester, Old Testament in one semester. And it's, it's en route to earning this degree in a liberal arts field, whereas it was never like that in the past. So, and, and I bring all that up to say that I think sometimes when we start classical so-called education really young, taste of it, and then we do it in high school, and then you go off to college, and maybe you do it again in, in college, reading always the great books, there isn't an arrival to what was always seen up at least until the scholastic period as the actual like capstone of a true Christian education was using all the tools of the liberal arts and philosophy to inform biblical studies. And so I, I like so the idea that you could read the Bible. so that you could read the Bible. Yeah. That was the, the one revealed text in history, the, the divinely inspired that, that reads all other literature. And so I I'm kind of pushing for that. Like the idea of that, that, mm-hmm. you know, that there is an end to these perennial questions from the pagan period and, and all of that, that, that they inform our biblical understanding. And it seems like there is some momentum in, in American uh, Catholicism with, you know, the Bible in a year podcast. I don't, I don't really listen to it, but I know a lot of people that do. And I think there's a lot of good resources like that coming back, but we always put the Bible alongside all the other great books. And I, I would love to see this shift to where, no, you study the liberal arts to get to the Bible. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Cause I, um, I mentioned I'm a convert, but my, well, my family was not, I didn't grow up anything, just kind of the Christ haunted South as uh, Flannery O'Connor put it. Um, but then I became a, a serious Protestant in, uh, you know, middle of high school 
and then later became a Catholic. But my time as a Protestant was very formative because of the intense study and attachment to scripture. I mean, I can't believe in such a short time in sort of a Protestant ethos, how much of the scripture I came to know and, and, love, and sort of just have it as a, and my wife, she had a similar conversion. We were kind of in similar um, time together, you know, reading and studying the scripture and stuff. So we sort of have this as a language and an understanding. It's funny you said that because we bring up a lot that it doesn't, I'm not sure in sort of all this classical and homeschooling world, they're not, they're not having that sort of sense of this arch text mm -hmm. of um, that's divinely inspired, that's set apart and completely different. It is sort of in the mix. Um, and I was on this past year, we read a really great book, but it was a, um, uh, I, I, I won't name it in case, you know, I don't know, the publisher gets upset or something, but it was sort of a retelling of scripture. And I thought, well, they're not even learning the language of, you know, some of this, just reading it directly. It's all this retelling and the narrative, all this, which I get, but just, so anyway, that's a, that's a fascinating insight. It's not how I was expecting you to uh, answer that, but um, do you have any advice or any experience as far as making, I, I don't know, the scriptures, it, it, it's like how to not make it just another topic, how to make it the, the, the arch text of the homeschool. Yeah, I think there's going to have to become some sort of so I, I individually, it could be done individually, it, it could like individual families, if they can just place so the idea that that was always there until this like, you know, 50 year experiment that we basically had in, in the recovery with with John Senior and and Thomas Aquinas College and these other movements, Colby Academy in 1980, like these movements to recover, recover liberal education as they call it liberal education for the free man like all of that i think it has to eventually be seen as a first step towards a true recovery of christian paideia so if you read you know saint augustine saint jerome like all these you know so every all those fathers of the fourth century they all saw that um the bible the bible knowledge of the scriptures was the was the the end game of course so what you had was in Greek paideia, you had this idea of liberal arts, which are the skills, the tools, grammar, logic, rhetoric. So you learn these in order to study philosophy. And that relegates then the liberal arts to being a pro paideia. So that means it's like a prerequisite, basically. So you learn the liberal arts, you move into the next stage, which would be philosophy. And um, after, so what happened after Christ, though, as early as the first century, second century, really, but I'm sure you see it in St. Paul as well, is then philosophy is relegated to a pro paideia for, for biblical exegesis, which is the top one. So I think in individual, individual homeschooling families, they could probably do that in, in a way. You'd have to figure it out your own way, but I, I, I think you could use the Bible as as the arch text uh you know your senior year your junior year or something like that possibly like it's it's what you're leading to mm -hmm. and then you really um the the hard thing the difficult thing though is is as we know from uh, church teaching that it's hard to understand the bible without a teacher especially um i i did the same i've read the bible incessantly as a protestant so i was always looking for theology and these different things but it's a different it is a different thing to read it as a Catholic. It's an awesome, unbelievable thing. It's like I'm discovering everything new now. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like when Philip in the book of Acts sees the Ethiopian reading Isaiah and he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I without a teacher? And then Philip expounds the scriptures for him. Well, the, the papal documents that are calling for this, you know, laity to read the Bible, they always cite that passage in the idea that, that you know you need a teacher you need something like that so i think in the in the end what's going to have to happen and i hope i'm a part of it is to have institutions and there are some out there but i think i think it could be done in an even better way in Inst catholic institutions of the bible where it's it's taking all this preparation in liberal arts the propaidea of philosophy the preparation in in philosophy the propaidea for biblical studies and then that's a real destination so you read all the great books or whatever that's that's been the challenge at little places like magdalene and christendom people i've talked to in these different institutions is 
convincing students to read the great books again in college. So my solution is, why don't we read the great book? Why isn't there a great book college yeah. that we can, uh, you know? Yeah. That's that, that's once again where I think uh, I could relate to your experience. I mean, you're you're you know, my, I, I'm an armchair theologian at best, and you're you know, you're a scholar. Um, but when I by, when I went to graduate school and had Catholic teachers, because I had had good teachers as a Protestant, you know, I didn't just read the you know, Protestants really don't just read the Bible; they do a lot of Bible studies, mm -hmm. you know, with people. And there's usually a, I mean, there there are some reckless Bible studies out there, which is just people opening the Bible and they're they're not formed in it well and they don't have good theology and they come up with disastrous things and start a new church you know um but there there was there's teachers and but reading it having good good mentors and guides as a process but then becoming a catholic and having it unlocked in a very scholarly graduate level was my, my could not believe the coherence and the beauty um of the scriptures and it was i mean his life changed to this day it just it all it sort of brought it into that aha moment of wholeness, you know, which I hope it, Lord help me would be some sort of form of wisdom given to us, you know, from the scriptures. I'm sure, um, I'm sure it was because I would say Clement of Alexandria has this great quote where he calls knowledge of the scriptures, the shortest path to truth. And I, I think I probably mm -hmm. took that same journey like you did where, you know, I went to Germany and studied in a Protestant faculty with a very skeptical Protestant, well-known professor. It led me to Catholicism. And from the Bible, I've read out to everything else, which is kind of the opposite of what we're providing our Catholic students. It's like you read the other stuff first. Yeah. But I think that road for some of us. Convert that's exactly, I'm sorry. I got to stop. That, yeah, that's exactly my experience, actually, yeah. is is now I'm reading. And in fact, because my uh, is, is all the romance of my freedom as a child. I did not, my wife was like, she always thought, oh, didn't you read this when you were a kid? I'm like, no, sweetie, I can't, I can't express this enough. I didn't read okay. anything. Okay. Yeah. I just played in the woods. That is all I did. Um, mm -hmm. but now, and then I had the conversion, the scriptures became important when the graduate school. And now I'm, uh, with my family where I'm sort of going in that direction too. And it's beautiful. It's, it's, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a better way you should consider, uh, promoting that even even more or at least not making people again feel worried that their kids are not you know reading greek classics in the sixth grade right um but hey you know what the, the problem is now we're going over our normal time this podcast length and so we're gonna have to do it some more i because because i need to get to a, a final question see I, I i can tell i got you to your true passion of the <laughs> scriptures now at the end so that's you, you started going with it but i have yeah. to return to some previous passions which sure. is uh do you advise that homeschool families allow their children, particularly their sons, uh, to shoot each other with BB guns? <laughs> well, I, the, the way I say it in my book is I, I, I ask the question to myself at the end of that chapter that describes the war. And I, I say, what are you doing? Are you, are, you, uh, are you telling people to shoot their another generation of boys to shoot their eyes out with BB guns? And then I say, no, but I am advising them to shoot their fear out in some way. So, yeah. you know, something that you feel Face. uncomfortable with, it doesn't have to be risking eyes and BB guns and stuff, but, uh, but not to be so afraid. I okay. Guess. Fair enough. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, I'd like to wrap up, but that what you just said, you know, you'll shoot your eye out. We're coming off a of Christmas tide when I'm, when we're recording this and, uh, <laughs> you know, a Christmas story, if anyone hasn't read the little house books and they, but, but they have seen, perhaps you had the, the poor formation like I did. But you've seen a Christmas story over and over year after year, the way that uh, Ralphie describes boyhood so accurately, his sense of justice, his desire for retribution. I think that's why that movie is so classic, is it yeah. gets in the mind of the boy. Um, everything from your story of the 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 boy uh, who wants to take your rock that he doesn't appreciate adequately um, uh, to the hilarity of um the, the 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 British man showing up to breakfast. Uh, I won't reveal too much, but uh, <laughs> le less than dressed. All of those things. Uh, I, I do want to encourage anyone listening to and keep. If you if you want, if you grew up and you're like me, you know this uh, a, a dad from the '90s. Now you're homeschooling, and you're, and you're and you're feeling nostalgic, and you want some of these things explained. And and ex they they are important. And you were on the cusp of something, and it's important for you to recall it accurately. I highly recommend uh, the book again. When the Earth Was Flat, One Boy's Life on the Edge of the Millennium by Jordan Almanzar, who uh, and by Colby Academy Press as a publisher, uh, who's been my guest today on Till and Keep. I appreciate it so much. I uh, I think we'll have to do it again because uh, 
or maybe not because we have a lot in common so we'll just ramble about what we like and it, it would make for a bad podcast or good podcast <laughs> i don't know how this podcast stuff works i don't have a smartphone so anyway jordan thank you so much uh any parting words of advice no, I just I want to thank you, Jason. And and I guess the words of advice is just keep going. Just keep going. If if you've started on this journey, don't be afraid. God will be with you and, and keep going. You'll be fine. Thanks, Jason. Oh, all right. Thanks, Jordan. All right. This has been Till and Keep Podcast. Thanks for listening. This episode of Till and Keep has been brought to you by Tan, Fraternus, and Sword and Spade. Till and Keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from God to Adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle. Visit tillandkeeppodcast.com to subscribe and follow the show. And use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.